And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Mark chapter 15 verse 39. The last moments of Jesus' life are recorded in Mark chapter 15 verses 33 to 39. The centurion was tasked with watching over the crucifixion and making sure everything went okay without any problems. Centurions had to be experienced in the military, having worked their way up through ranks over a span of many years. Leadership skills were paramount for successfully commanding an army unit consisting of 80, 100 soldiers and maintaining order among them. Courageousness on the battlefield was required since centurions acted from leading positions within it. The scene at the crucifixion of Jesus was incredibly compelling, so much that even a tough Roman centurion recognized him as the Son of God. His innocence from any offense had been made clear by this realization. Jesus was on the cross for precisely this cause, to confirm his guiltlessness. The centurion must have gone through an array of sentiments after realizing he oversaw killing someone who did nothing wrong. Unlike it what one could hear murmured by scared new recruits or trembling conscripts who were easily manipulated, that was the considered opinion of a veteran soldier, who had seen so many men meet horrible ends and been responsible for taking their lives. This centurion knew just how harshly Jesus had been condemned by Jewish religious leaders for supposedly committing blasphemy. Pontius Pilate, his commander-in-chief, agreed with the verdict that led to Jesus being crucified but this same centurion refused to accept it. Why? Because there was plenty of convincing evidence supporting Christ's claim. We have to bear in mind that this guy probably oversaw many crucifixions. Nevertheless, something incredibly unique was about this particular execution. What did he witness? Jesus' journey to the cross was filled with obstacles. He was betrayed, laughed at, degraded and subjected to torture. If all of that wasn't enough for him, something else caught his eye. He saw how nature responded around him. We know from scripture that the earth vibrated, rocks cracked open, and even creation itself quaked at death of God's child. Humanity didn't respond in kind with Jesus' cries out in pain during his last moments on earth, but the very land did tremble under him, as if it were mourning alongside him. What a thought-provoking image this is. It begs us to consider what we're made up of. Are our hearts so unresponsive when tragedy strikes? Or do they ache alongside creation like those rocks which split wide open? On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Amos 8, 9. The people who had often asked Christ for a sign from heaven now have one. But this sign signifies their blindness. As he hangs on the cross, Jesus breathes his last. Mark chapter 15 verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. This would be from noon to three in the afternoon. This supernatural darkness occurred while the sun was shining at its zenith. Since the moon was full, it could not have been created by an eclipse, because the moon cannot come between the earth and the sun when it is full. This darkness was undoubtedly brought about by the swift intervention of God. Phlegon of Tralles, a freedman of Emperor Hadrian, gives a description of it. Eusebius, in his Chronicles of the Year A.D., abundantly quotes Phlegon, who states that in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, an eclipse of the sun happened that was extraordinarily large and great beyond all those previously known. At the sixth hour, the day was turned into night so that the stars were seen in the heavens, and there was a great earthquake in Bithynia which overthrew many houses in the city of Nicaea. Phlegon attributes the darkness, which he describes, to an eclipse which does not surprise us. Astronomical knowledge was rudimentary at the time. An earthquake is also mentioned by Phlegon. This puts his account in close agreement with the sacred narrative. Saint Cyprian adds, the sun was forced to withdraw its rays and close its eyes so as not to be obliged to look upon this crime of the Jews. In the same vein, St. Chrysostom declares that the creature could not bear the wrong done to its creator. Therefore the sun withdrew its rays so as not to see the deeds of the wicked. The fact that darkness appears at such a critical moment can signify several things. First, in antiquity, 
darkness was associated with mourning. It was also associated with the death of great men. Pagan and Jewish readers would have seen it as a cosmic sign accompanying the death of a king. Second, this darkness was similarly seen as a sign of God's judgment. Mark chapter 15 verse 34 And at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, Mark uses the Aramaic form here. Matthew refers to the original Hebrew, Mark chapter 15 verse 35. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. Those who lingered around the cross despite the mysterious darkness are mentioned in verse 35. The darkness certainly added to the eeriness of the situation. It was out of this darkness that Jesus' voice was heard. Since Elijah was believed to have some relationship to the Messiah, it was natural for some of those standing there to interpret these words as meaning that our Lord was in fact calling for Elijah. Mark chapter 15 verse 36 And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. Verse 37 And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and gave up the ghost. Verse 38 and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. There were two veils, one before the holy place and the second before the holy of holies. The holy place would correspond to what we call the nave of the temple, in which the priests were always present. And the holy of holies would correspond to our chancel, the most sacred part of the building. This place was always closed, and no one could enter except the high priest, and that only once a year on the Day of Atonement. The veil that was torn at the death of our Lord was the one that was before the Holy of Holies. It was the responsibility of the officiating priests in the evening of the Day of Preparation, at the hour of evening prayer, which would correspond to the hour of our Lord's death, to enter into the holy place, where of course he would be between the two curtains or veils, the outer veil and the inner veil. It would then be his responsibility to draw back the outer veil, exposing the sacred space to the people in the outer court. Then there, to their great astonishment, they would witness the inner veil torn from top to bottom. According to the historian Josephus, these veils or curtains were of immense weight, heavy and magnificently embroidered with gold and purple. This tearing of the veil now signified first that the first dispensation with its rites and ceremonies was now revealed by Christ, and that from this moment on, the middle wall of separation was broken down, so that from now on, not only Jews, but also Gentiles, could approach through the blood of Christ. Secondly, it also implied that the way to heaven was opened by our Lord's death. When you overcame the sting of death, you opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. The veil signified that heaven was closed to all until Christ, by his death, tore that veil in two and opened the way. Mark chapter 15 verse 39 And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. The centurion's job was to oversee everything and make sure the sentence was carried out. He had to stand near the cross and there was something in the whole bearing of the dying man, so different from anything he had seen before, which drew from him the spontaneous cry, Truly this man was the Son of God. He had watched him through those strangest hours. He had seen the meekness and dignity of the sufferer. He had heard those deeply graven words of faith and reverence that fell from him from time to time as he hung there. And then, at last he heard that piercing, surprising, unexpected cry that broke from him just before he yielded up the ghost. And he could come to no other conclusion but this. He was truly the Son of God. In just a few verses, Mark packs a lot of intensity. There is much to say about the strange events that are occurring, but today we are drawn to the Roman officer admiring Jesus after his death. Jesus had influenced those who were close to him, the thief on the cross had uniquely reacted to him, and now the soldier overseeing him notices he is the Son of God. Jesus had kept his identity hidden early in his ministry, but now it was clear to everyone. 
As a centurion, he was responsible for the soldiers who handled Jesus. Did he take part in the mocking and beating of Jesus when they crowned him with thorns? Perhaps, or perhaps he was too upstanding for such buffoonery. Maybe he was the one who tasked Simon of Cyrene with bearing Jesus' cross. Once they arrived at Golgotha, the place of crucifixion, nails were driven into Jesus' wrists and he was lifted up on the cross. This really was just another day on the job for them. His role was to oversee the execution of the condemned by crucifixion. But somewhere along the way, Jesus ceased to look like a common criminal in his eyes. Maybe it was how Jesus engaged with the powers of this world. He never begged for his life. Perhaps it was Jesus' words of love from the cross that touched him. Maybe it was the strange darkness that covered the land. Perhaps it was the tearing of the veil. Or maybe Jesus had conveyed the truth to this officer as they traveled along the road. Something was stirring in this man's soul as he gazed upon Jesus' lifeless body, whatever the reason. I picture him staring fixedly at the cross, mouth agape, grasping for words to express his thoughts. This man truly was the Son of God. What a declaration from a Roman officer. Had any of the religious leaders heard him say it, they would have been incensed. They had just spent the previous day persuading Rome to execute Jesus precisely because he was blaspheming by claiming to be the Son of God. It's one thing to acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God when he's alive. Peter acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah in Mark chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. But Jesus charges them, and he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. When Jesus is alive, it's one thing to recognize him as the Son of God. It's another to recognize Jesus as the Son of God after the resurrection. Many people came to faith at that time. But to recognize Jesus as the Son of God when he is dead, and all hope seems lost, this Roman officer may be the only person to have done such a thing. If so, he came as a pagan, and, like the thief on the cross who believed, he was saved as Jesus hung on the cross. It's as simple as that. All who are saved are saved because of Jesus' death on the cross. So the cross began its work immediately, and it has continued for two millennia since. It is this powerful cross and the love displayed there that touches hearts, even hardened hearts accustomed to a soldier's life of combat, from death unto life. An old saying goes that the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. This was true in the first century, and it remains true today. It's at the foot of the cross that everyone, rich and poor, finds level ground to kneel on and embrace the Christ who died for them. Surely this was the Son of God. We have heard and believed. But the journey must not end there. We must have the passion to know him more deeply. Philippians 3.10 That I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. 11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, that I may know him better by more fully understanding the wondrous excellencies of his person, and experiencing likewise the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I may share the communion of his sufferings by being continually inwardly conformed to his likeness, even to his death, by dying as he did. May that same desire burn in our hearts, that we may honestly know the one who loved us and gave himself for us. So what became of this Roman officer? One can only wonder how the encounter with Jesus affected this soldier's life going forward. Did he become a Christian? I'm sure he had a lot on his mind in the days that followed, especially when the rumor spread that Jesus was still alive. Perhaps the gravity of his crimes against Jesus dawned on him. What we do know is that it wasn't too late for him. While on the cross, Jesus was paying the price for that officer's sins. He was paving the way for the officer to be with his father. As Stuart Townend wrote in the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, Here is the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. We must realize Jesus died for us. Don't reject him once you know him. Once you've heard the gospel and turned it away, you can never be the same. 
It's said when the rich young man rejected Christ, he went away sorrowful, emotionally disturbed. For when you reject the claims of Christ, it is a very serious matter. It will be an hour of decision for many of you who receive him today. So what became of that Roman officer? The pulpit commentary reports the legend that the centurion's name was Longinus, that he became a devoted disciple of Jesus, preached the gospel, and died a martyr. This is just a theory, we don't know if that happened. But we do know truth has a way of sticking to someone's heart. The cross of Jesus has the power to change the individual. The centurion started the day as a Roman officer overseeing a crucifixion, but ended it recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Indeed, the message of the cross is foolishness, absurdity, nonsense to those who are perishing and spiritually dead because they reject it. But to us who are saved by God's grace, it is the manifestation of God's power. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. A message that is to Jews a stumbling block arousing their opposition, and to Gentiles sheer folly, utter nonsense. But to the called both Jew, Greek and Gentile, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 23, 24. The ball is now in your court. What a powerful thought. God has already taken the initiative of salvation. Christ has died for you. Now the ball is in your court. Jesus gave up his life so that we could get ours back. He died as we do so we can live as he does. Not only did he please his Father, but he gifted us to himself. As the stand-in for sinful humanity, Jesus suffered the withdrawal of fellowship with the Father. As horrible as that was, he accomplished God's good and loving plan of redemption. My friends, the account of the centurion at the cross shows us the tremendous power of Christ's sacrifice. This hardened soldier, having overseen countless executions, was moved to declare Jesus as the Son of God after witnessing the events surrounding his crucifixion. Even creation itself reacted to the death of its maker. As we reflect on Christ's passion, what is our response? Will we continue to ignore his great love shown for us? Or will we, like the centurion, recognize Jesus as who he claimed to be, the Messiah, the very Son of God? On the cross, Jesus cried out, It is finished. The debt of sin was paid completely that day. And now the invitation is open to each of us. By believing in Christ, confessing our sins, and accepting his gift of salvation, we can have life everlasting. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As we conclude, I appeal to you. Don't delay in surrendering your life to the one who surrendered his for you. The centurion declared, Surely this was the Son of God. May you reach the same conclusion. He died and rose again so that we could have eternal life in him. Trust in Christ today. Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son and providing the way of salvation.